Welcome back, everybody. This Week in America, website thisweekinamerica.us. Roger Bowes was born in San Francisco, California in 1921, attended Stanford University, graduating in 1942, and the day following graduated, uh, graduation, reported for duty at Camp Roberts, California, as a second lieutenant of the field artillery. He spent almost four years in the Army, the last 11 months of which were in combat in Europe. He returned home in 1945. He served in General Patton's favorite division, earning the prestigious Silver Star. And upon his return to San Francisco, he entered his family's automotive business, simultaneously proceeded to develop a civically oriented career in a variety of ways. Membership on the San Francisco Board of Supervisors, a TV producer and moderator on PBS TV, Chief Administrative Officer of the City of San Francisco for 10 years, State Chairman of the California Democratic Party. Battle Rattle is the name of his new book, A Last Memoir of World War II. It is Roger's first book, and it's a pleasure to have you on the program. Roger, thank you so much for joining us. Great pleasure for me, too, Dip. Thank you. This is a gripping book, and you said that this basically is 70 years of hindsight. Would you have been able to have done this book maybe 20, 30 years ago, or is it those extra years of wisdom that really is what makes this book stand out? <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, I, uh, I, wrote, <clears throat> I wrote a huge number of letters home to my mother and father and my grandmother, and they saved every scrap. And I based the, the basic information in the book on those letters. And uh, it was perhaps a, I could not have written about the fact that I had developed post-traumatic stress disorder uh, 30 or 40 years ago because people were not familiar with it. It wasn't on the, wasn't uh, being considered. Well, and that's interesting. I had what they call battle rattle. Well, yeah, that's the name of the book, battle rattle. That's what they called it in World War II. Shell shock is a term we've heard before. That was used in World War One. And you said it took three more questionable wars before they gave, a, gave it a clinical name, which is post-traumatic stress syndrome. And you were back from war for a number of years before you actually found out what you had. Yes, that's correct. Uh, I knew I was in mental and emotional trouble of some sort. Uh, I was a Christian scientist and didn't seek psychiatric help, which... Perhaps I should have. Uh, I could not focus very well on make important life decisions at all. And it took me a number of years to probably seven or eight years before I sort of came out of this uh, rather grim situation. And how did you do that? How were you able, because it wasn't diagnosed, you were not seeking help at the, at the time, medical help, psychiatric help. You sort of came out of this on your own. How did you, how did you fight through this? Well, a couple of uh, things that came along that helped me. Uh, I went one summer to Aspen, Colorado, and uh, uh, a professor from uh, the University of Chicago had a, uh, uh, a, a sort of a great books thing going, and he asked me to be one of his leaders in San Francisco, and that helped me a little bit, just thinking about books and these particular masterpieces and discussing them with a the class that I led. Right. But uh, actually... Uh, the thing that helped me the most was when a friend of mine, whom I admired and respected greatly, uh, an Austrian refugee who was a professor, a junior professor of economics, uh, took me aside one day and he and he said, "This was in, now. This was in about the 1954, something like that." He said, uh, "Boas." Uh, why don't you try and get a job on PBS, the new public broadcasting system? You've got a good voice, and you think, well, blah, blah. And I thought he was crazy. <laughs> but I applied to the local um, PBS station called KQED-TV, and I ended up uh, being selected by them to both co-produce and moderate 
one of the first public television shows in here in Northern California. It was called Profile Bay Area. And uh, all of a sudden, I found myself mentally changing fast in this business of not being able to make decisions or focusing uh, disappeared, mostly disappeared. That's all in the book, Battle Rattle. It's uh, written by our guest in the program, uh, Roger Boas. The website is very simple, battlerattlememoir.com. You can link onto that by going to our website, thisweekinamerica.us. The book's about the people as much as it is combat, and, and let's talk about that. This is such a gripping book, and, and you talk about um, the fear never leaves you, and you talked about uh, nighttime in particular, and I can almost sense that as you're writing about it. Talk about what that's like. You have the quiet, then you have uh, uh, incoming mortar rounds, which you said is probably the most frightening sound that you ever heard. Well, the Army never uh, predicted or trained us in uh, how to handle fear. And uh, I spent a good deal of time training in the Mojave Desert, which was called the Desert Training Center in those days, in my armored division, and ended up in England. Uh, and all the time there, uh, my comrades and I were saying, "Let's get over there. Let's get this. Let's get. Let's get. Let's get in the battle. Let's fight." But once we crossed the English Channel uh, and saw just a long line of stretchers with wounded Americans on them, some very badly wounded, waiting to go back to England. Uh, the realization struck me, and I'm sure everybody else, that we were in a life and de or death situation, and the fear just hit like a ton of bricks. And for me, it never left. It was there. I was in combat for 11 months, and the fear was ever-present. And uh, sometimes there would be a break. We'd play poker in the evening, me and some of my uh, uh, colleagues. Or we'd, we'd, just, we'd find some champagne and have a drink. But always under the condition that something might happen in the next few seconds that would uh, change everything for us. And you write about how fragile life is. You talk about you're there with... Uh... Uh, with three fellow soldiers, and literally seconds later, they're 50 feet away from you, and the only thing left of them are, are, are the aluminum dog tags. I didn't quite hear that. Would you say that again, please? Yeah, I was talking about the, uh, how fragile life is, and you write about being there with uh, three comrades, three fellow soldiers, and uh, an incoming round hits them, and and literally seconds later, they're gone. All that's left of them are the uh, are the dog tags. Yes, that's right. That happened several times. The first time was in uh, the, the city of Troy, France. And uh, I can't describe what it does to one's psyche to see a half-track with uh, sort of burned-out corpses in it, burned out from the shell fire. Uh, that were there uh, just a few minutes before. Uh, in general, I found absolutely nothing uh, good about the war. Every bit of every every second was was bad business. The book is called Battle Rattle. Our guest in the program is the author Roger Boas. His website is battlerattlememoir.com. Also, uh, information on Twitter and Facebook, and uh, you can link on to our website thisweekinamerica.us and get more information. Book is available all across the country. It's interesting because you say many of us died in the fields of France and Germany, later in the battlefields of life. By God's grace, I outlive most of them, and it's given me plenty of time to think what it all meant and whether it was all worth it. Have you been able to sort out those those questions? I've tried to. Uh, <clears throat> I, I, it's terrible to see your friends die. And uh, when I was on occupation duty, I was looking forward to seeing uh, one of my friends who had just been transferred to another uh, field artillery outfit on Nicaea, killed an action report on him. 
and uh, and the loss is just extraordinary. If you, in many cases you can't forget it. And uh, I wondered, was it worth it? No question in my mind that Adolf Hitler had to be stopped, and that if Hitler, I knew a good deal about him. I'd studied about him in high school. My mother was a, a student of German politics and uh, kept me bringing me up to date. So when he took over in the early 30s, I was totally familiar with him and his and the Nazi cohorts of his. Uh, but I never realized how ghastly it could be. And, of course, when I was fighting, we didn't know about uh, the concentration camps. And we didn't know about all the mass uh, killings by gas that were taking place in Poland and Russia and so forth. They killed about six million Jews alone, plus a lot of others. Well, in the book Battle Rattle, you you talk about an incident that... that shook the foundation of your very being. It was in April of, of, of 1945. You, you were deep in Germany. Talk about that, because to this day, this has sort of molded who, who you are. And it changed you dramatically. Well, my battalion commander, who was a good, became a lifelong friend named Bob Parker, and I, I was a, a first lieutenant. He was a lieutenant colonel. I was the battalion adjutant, which meant that he and I uh, connected all the time. Uh, we're uh, in a situation where our field artillery was moving forward along with the entire uh, division uh, in eastern Germany. And it was moving slowly. We were on the, the Autobahn, and we came across a brand-new building. It looks brand-new to us, and... So we took off and went into it rather quickly, and it belonged to the IG Farben head. And uh, we looked out one of the windows, uh, and over a bunch of trees, we see a courtyard uh, filled with dead bodies, piled up. And so we raced down, left the house, uh, raced across the street in our jeeps, And it turned out we were probably the first Americans in any concentration camp in Europe. Uh, That camp now is featured in the uh, Holocaust Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. And it was ghastly. Uh, It's impossible to describe how awful it was. And we couldn't stay there long. We had to go on. Uh, We were in, in, in a fighting mode and had had to keep moving. Uh, but it, it just shook me to the core. I'm a, I was Jewish as well as being a Christian Zionist. And the, the bodies were piled with the uh, dead bodies. Looked looked like they'd been killed only an hour or so previously. Shots in the head. And they had the star, of, uh, the Jewish star on their uh, on their clothes. They, they, were, they looked just dreadful. And uh, uh, ten days later, on April uh, 14th, General Eisenhower went to the camp with General Patton and General Bradley, and one of the three generals threw up. Uh, and that sort of a situation, uh, I'm sure, set me back emotionally. Uh, but it's not the sort of thing that one likes to even talk about, much less think about. Yeah, you said it took a lifetime to, to come to terms with, and that's all in the book. It's an excellent book, Battle Rattle, A Last Memoir of World War II, uh, written by Roger Boas. That's B-O-A-S. The website is battlerattlememoir.com. The book's available all across the country. There's a Facebook page for Battle Rattle as well. You can link on to all of that information by going to our website, thisweekinamerica.us. When you returned at the end of 1945, and you're probably thinking, this is sort of behind me now. I can get back in. I can hook up with friends. I can get my life back on track. What Two old friends that you knew before the war, you were going to hook up with, and your dad tells you that, that both of them died during the course of the war. 
numerous stories like that. How do you deal with that when you come back and, and you're faced with all of these stories and, and friends that you had that you found out didn't make it? I think I was a rather impossible person to deal with when I came back. When we were on occupation in Germany, I could have uh, selected to go to a British university, Oxford or Cambridge, or a university in, in, in Paris, or stay in the military and uh, go into intelligence or something of that sort. But I couldn't get over. I just wanted to get home. I wanted to get home. And when I arrived home, I hated it. My parents were very nice to me and my grandmother, and they never, ever talked about the war to me. Um, and I felt sort of alone and isolated. And uh, then when I learned that close friends had died, one of them had been a classmate at, uh, at Stanford and elected president of a student body, uh, it just... Uh, I, I was kind of a lost soul for a long, long time. That's certainly easy to understand, and all that you've been through, and uh, several minutes left in the program, we're, we're now in a situation, and have been for a number of years, talking about uh, U.S. military intervention in a number of countries around the world. You've been there. You've seen the results of, of, of what can happen, the positive as well as the negative. When you hear all of the, the saber rattlings, what are your thoughts about heading into war? Do we do it almost too casually? I think we do it far too casually. And I think we do it because our governments and governments of other countries are weak in their leadership. And it's easier to send troops to war and shoot at one another. It seems to be easier than to conduct productive diplomacy. Uh, we should be negotiating all these problems instead of flying bombers and so forth, in my opinion. There, in my opinion, there is nothing at all good to say about war, and therefore should be avoided at almost all costs. We had to go in and fight Hitler, but I think we did not have to go into Vietnam uh, a few years back. Uh, we didn't have to go into uh, Iraq uh, at all, uh, and... Uh, this was a lack, it seems to me, of good leadership uh, among the leaders in our, our country as well as uh, in other countries. Listening to the campaigns today, they're all saying, let's build up the military, build up the military. They should be saying, let's build up our ability to negotiate. Let's build up our diplomatic corps. Let's put more money into the State Department here or the Foreign Office in in France, etc. Instead, they go in and drop bombs and shoot, and it is the worst way to go, in my opinion. We seem to be living in an age where diplomacy doesn't count for much, and we really don't want to compromise. It's sort of our way, or we will take drastic, uh, drastic measures. The book is really, unfortunately, we're out of time. An interesting read. It's called Battle Rattle, the La a Last Memoir of World War II. Roger Boas, that's B-O-A-S, our guest on the program and the author. The book is available at uh, Amazon bookstores all across the country. Information at the website BattleRattleMemoir.com, a Facebook page and Twitter as well. And you can link on to all of that information by going to our website, ThisWeekInAmerica.us. Roger, it was a pleasure having you on the program, uh, a pleasure to be able to read the book. It brings a, a whole new perspective to what we're even going through in the news today because these are young men just like you and all the others that you were with that are, that are fighting these battles. It puts everything in a, uh, in a much better perspective. Thank you so much for being with us on the program. I thank you, and it's an honor to have been on your program and get your good questions. Thank you very much. Well, it's our pleasure to have you with us on the program. And once again, Roger Boas, our guest. The book is called Battle Rattle, A Last Memoir of World War II. You're listening to This Week in America, our website, thisweekinamerica.us.